From your World News Headquarters on the World Wide Web, it's time for your daily dose of sanity. This is the Maria Heller Show. Maria Heller is a published author, founder of The Universal Wheel, a lifestyle and philosophy based on our interconnectedness to all living things, a great key master, and delivers the news with spiritual views. How many intuitive news decoders, animal rights activists, and vegetarian broadcasters are there? Just one. Maria. Maria has provided independent news for a smart audience for over 13 years now on the Maria Heller Show, available at maria.net. M-E-R-I-A dot net. And now, here is your host, the mouth that roars, Maria Heller. Uh, Good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. Today, we are taking a breather from the ugliness in the world, and we're going to give you information that you're going to love for yourself. We're not too far away from New Year's, where everybody comes up with their New Year's resolutions, which never seem to work out for them. But today, we're going to give you some really good pointers, so maybe you want to look at today's show as your New Year's resolution. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest. His name is Scott Shetler. He's the owner of Extreme Performance Training Systems located in Atlanta, Georgia. He has a degree in health and physical education. He's also certified by the National Strength and Conditioning Association. He's been featured in many articles for web-based and print publications. He's also served as a strength and conditioning contributor to mixed martial arts publications of all types. He's also competed in powerlifting and kettleboard, uh, kettlebell sports, and he's currently studying Qigong. He's also committed to a compassionate lifestyle, and he follows a plant-based nutrition plan. So uh, today we're going to be talking about one of his, I think, six books, his latest book, Plant-Based Performance, A Compassionate Approach to Health and Fitness. So I'm very pleased to have Scott with me. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Maria. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. <laughs> These are the Great. kind of shows I love to do. And by the way, I want my audience to know that any proceeds from this book, if you choose to buy it, and I think it's excellent, uh, goes to Mercy for Animals, my favorite person, Nathan Runkle's organization. And Nathan will be on the show again next month, so you'll want to stay tuned for that. Scott, you have quite the interesting personal story, so I thought we would start with that. How'd you get started on all of this? Uh, You know, I mean, it was was a bit of a transition for me. Uh, I started out in the health and fitness industry, and uh, my first exposure, you know, to that industry was mainly through bodybuilding and and strength sports, and, you know, it just kind of goes without saying that it's pretty much assumed that those types of uh, athletes, those types of lifters and stuff have to consume a tremendous amount of protein and, and you know, the more animal-based, the better. That, that's, you know, what you're kind of uh, uh, spoon-fed when you start coming up into the industry. So I spent many years studying, you know, bodybuilding, uh, sports science, strength and conditioning. I eventually started powerlifting. And as I was getting bigger and stronger, uh, certainly my lifts were going up, but my overall health was starting to go down. You know, I wasn't feeling great all the time. Uh, while I was certainly stronger in the gym, you know, my joints hurt. Uh, they were achy. Uh, I was putting on a lot of bad weight, which that's typically uh, synonymous with powerlifting. You know, any weight is good weight is what they say. Mm. Uh, but, you know, after a couple trips to the doctor, uh, the cholesterol started going up, triglycerides started going up, and here I am working in the health and fitness industry trying to teach people how to be healthy, and I'm doing the opposite. So I started to kind of look back and see if I was doing the right things or, or I, I, I guess I had something in me that was saying, you know, what you're doing is not right. So I started thinking, you know, maybe there was a different way, a better way. And I have always been interested in, in animals and animal welfare. And we, you know, my wife and I have a bunch of pets and stuff like that. And I just, I've always felt this kind of tug to pursue, you know, vegetarian and vegan nutrition, and I just never really jumped into it because of that, that kind of stigma with the, the strength training. You know, you, you've got to eat tons of protein and tons of protein and tons of protein. And then finally, I just, it, it just hit me one day. Uh, I, I had kind of a, a horrible uh, experience, um, and I just made the switch. I said, all right, it's time to, it's time to, cut, out the, uh, time to cut out the animal products. 
I did it like a lot of people. You know, I took the red meat out. I took the the, the fowl, the efficient fowl out, and and eventually I uh, turned out the eggs and the dairy and have switched 100% to uh, plant-based nutrition. And it, it was about a year, year and a half, you know, before I'd finally gotten everything out of my uh, nutrition plan. But uh, it's, you know, it's a big misconception that you need all that animal-based protein, that you even need a ton of protein to be strong, to be healthy, to be fit. And in addition, not only did, you know, I continue to improve my physical fitness, but my uh, health became better when, when I went to my doctor, you know, for my annual physical. It was the first time everything checked out perfect. And his words to me were just keep doing what you're doing. You know, <laughs> when, when I told him what I was doing, he said, well, of course, we got to check the beef well, right? Right. Uh, but, yeah, but no, I mean, everything checked out great. Uh, and I just, that's the track I've been on ever since. You know, I, I dropped an easy 50 pounds over about four or five months. Um, my joints feel better. I'm, I'm, I'm looser. My flexibility is better. My mobility is better. Uh, and I'm not training as intense as when I was competing. You know, I've actually turned more toward uh, Tai Chi, Qigong, you know, the internal martial arts and stuff. And just overall, I feel a lot better. That's great. Now, let me ask you, how, how old or how young were you when you were uh, started and your health started failing? Um, it was about, I'd say my mid, mid to late 20s, you know, about 20, uh, about 27, you know, 26, 27 is when I really took an interest in uh, powerlifting. And, and then the, the diet plan was eat as much as whatever you can get your hands on. You know, it was, it was size over size and strength over everything else. Uh, it consisted of a lot of, a lot of animal, you know, a lot of meat, a lot of protein, um, a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of fat, not always the best sources. But it was definitely focused on the meat, you know, get the meat in and, and then the, the tubs of the different protein, you know, whey protein powders and stuff like that. I was consuming a lot of, uh, a lot of milk, uh, you know, a lot of whole milk and stuff like that, dairy, cheese, um, just that really calorie dense protein heavy foods uh, that tend to be, you know, really prominent in the mainstream bodybuilding and, and strength athletes diet. And it took about, I mean, the first year was pretty good. I put on a lot of strength very fast. My, my size started going up, but I'd say after the first year is when I started laying on more body fat, my conditioning, and granted, I wasn't doing a lot of cardiovascular training as it was, but my conditioning wasn't that great. You know, I, I'd get winded walking up steps. My, my wife and I went out to Colorado uh, my first time at really high altitudes and stuff. We were staying in Keystone, and I mean, I was you know, I was huffing just taking the luggage in from the car to the, to the cabin that we were staying in. And it was just little things like that that I started to notice. You know, I just wasn't mm. wasn't feeling all that great. And, you know, the joints started hurting. And I think that's coupled with, you know, the high red meat consumption plus the heavy, heavy lifting and the loading on the joints. You know, it was probably a one-two punch that kind of did that. And then just every annual physical, you know, my cholesterol was always just a little bit higher. My triglycerides were higher. You know, everything was getting outside of the acceptable ranges. And finally, my doctor started throwing around terms like, you know, cholesterol medicines and, you know, things like that. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm like 30 years old. You know, this is not, this is not cool. You know, to be in your mm. early 30s and start hearing this stuff. And, right. and, and it was a slow process, you know, but mm. uh, that, that, that was mainly about when it, uh, when it started to take effect. Well, that's, that's amazing. You know, I have, uh, it just happened today. I got a, an email from a good friend who, you know, she says she feels like she has the flu and she realizes she has a lot of inflammation happening in her body. And I was checking out some people on Facebook, and they were complaining about the same thing, you know, uh, inflammations of their joints and different things like that. Uh, and, you know, it's very difficult to tell people that don't want to hear it. And, and I'm not saying not all of them don't want to hear it, but difficult to tell them, you know, you need to look at your diet. And for some reason, people refuse to make the connection to their diet and their physical body. Absolutely. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, in actuality, <laughs> my back popped out, and my chiropractor, uh, I was telling her, you know, she says, well, your back's inflamed. One of my lower uh, discs was inflamed. And I said, well, you know, what could it be causing it, you know? Because I really didn't do anything to pop the back, but sometimes it just happens. And she said to me, you need to, it, it's either sugar or wheat. She says, and I know you don't eat wheat. She said, so try and cut out all your sugar, see what happens. Well, I can tell you two days after not using any sugar, the inflammation was gone. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I believe it. And, you know, for me, it was, uh, I mean, I, I did eat a bit of sugar, you know, in, in my time. You know, I've been guilty of eating some Oreos here and there. But, you know, I, I think the biggest, the, the, the most drastic change in the way my joints felt was after cutting out uh, red meat. Because when, when I decided to uh, start pursuing more of a vegetarian approach to nutrition, mm-hmm. the first thing to go was was the the meat, the, the, the red meat, and then the, uh, the fowl. And, and I continued to eat fish. A little bit, not, you know, maybe once or twice a, a week I would have fish. Um, and then I was still eating, you know, a lot of eggs and things like that. But I think getting the red meat out because I consumed, I, you know, I was eating red meat daily, you know, when I was powerlifting and, and sometimes multiple times a day. Mm-hmm. And uh, once, because that's the stuff that I stopped cold turkey. And I'd say within the first month, even though my diet still, you know, that, that's a distinction I, I got to make here. My diet was not healthy even after I started cutting out meat and slowly taking out the animal products. I still wasn't getting an abundance of fresh fruit and vegetables and, and that type of stuff. That came later. You know, even after right. I cut out meat, you know, vegetables for me were like carrots and potatoes. You know what I mean? Right. It wasn't like I wasn't getting greens and I wasn't getting a variety of vegetables and fresh fruits and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But even just cutting out the meat and still having, you know, some of the, the more vegetarian and, and vegan junk foods in my diet, Mm-hmm. Uh, I still notice the difference in my uh, in, in how my joints felt, you know, so right. it, I think that was huge for me. Right. Well, let me explain, you know, for me, you know, my chiropractor knows I'm already, a, you know, a vegetarian. I have been since 2000. Uh, and so for her, she had to go with, you know, well, what else could it possibly be? And she figured it was sure. either sugar or wheat. Uh, you know, for me, the turning point, you know, I put it off as long as everybody else tries to. And I used all the same excuses everybody else does. And I remember in uh, early 2000, I won a free trip to Tahiti. And the book I decided to take with me uh, was John Robbins' book, uh, not The Food Revolution, but he came out with a second book. I don't remember right now the name of it. Uh, and I was reading that on the eternal flight to Tahiti, which never seemed to end. And I just looked at my partner at the time, and I said to him, I said, this is it. I'm no longer eating meat. And it, for me, it was you know, the end of the excuses. Uh, on a plus side, because I read some of the stories in your book, and you have great people contributing to this book with so much yeah, good information. Fantastic fantastic lineup of people for sure right i don't remember which one which woman it was but she talked about her thyroid problem and interestingly enough at that point in my life i had been on thyroid medication for 13 years and two years after becoming vegetarian my doctor called me after my usual six-month blood work and he says, Maria, you don't need the medication anymore your thyroid's working and i was over 50 years old and I said to him, well, the only thing I've done different is I became a vegetarian. And he really paid no attention to that. It was like, a, you know, to him, it was just an aside. And he's like, just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, I've been medication free ever since. That's outstanding. Yeah. So, you know, people have to get, you know, and I try to explain this to people. You know, the meat people eat today is not the same meat my grandmother ate. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you have so much hormones and, and, and animal hormones in what you're eating. Of course, that's going to disrupt your hormonal systems because we're humans, okay? And we're supposed to have human hormones. I know you, you mentioned several times in the book the fabulous film, Forks Over Knives. And yeah. I had watched that a few months ago, and I have to tell you, I was very proud of myself because pretty much every doctor in that book has been on my, in that movie has been on my show. Oh, that's great. And, you know, two of the people that were featured uh, that had small features in Forks Over Knives was uh, uh, the UFC fighter Mac Danzig and then uh, the Iron Woman uh, triathlete and endurance athlete, uh, Dr. Ruth Heidrich. And both of them actually contributed to the uh, plant-based performance book as well. And they're, they're both amazing people in their own right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I really appreciate what you said, that it took you over a year, a year and a half, to really get it together diet-wise. And people have to get, you know, it is a process. Believe me, it was a process for me to become a vegetarian. But for me, vegetarian, being Italian, meant a whole lot of carbs. And, you know, I, I, I will admit I'm carbohydrate addicted. There's no doubt in my mind. And then I started working with a trainer two years ago. And 
I, you know, I said to him, you know, I've been training so long and doing the same routine and, you know, I'm not losing any weight and blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he said, I would like you to try something for a month. He says, just for a month, cut out all your carbs and all processed food. And I have to tell you, Scott, I looked at him as an Italian and I thought I was going to faint on the floor. And I said to him, but I'm Italian. I said, how will I live without pizza, pasta, and, you know, bread and all that? And he said, just for a month, Maria. And we started, he worked out a program, you know, specific for me. Uh, so the month passes, and it's a funny story. I even told this to the owners of my gym, and, and they were cracking up. They said, it's a great story, Maria. At the end of the first month, I looked at him and I said, okay, can I go get a slice of pizza now? I was like, Johnson for pizza, like a drug addict. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, Maria, you're not exactly where I want you to be. Why don't we try it for another month? <clears throat> so I said, oh my God, another month, right? And uh, at the end of the second month, he gave me the same story. But it was funny, by the end of the third month, he says, okay, Maria, you're pretty much where I want you to be. I'll take you for a slice of pizza. And I looked at him and I said, pizza? No way. I said, I'm working out too hard to screw this up now. And I had dropped uh, 30 pounds. Wow. So, you know, because my goal was to get lean. Look, you know, my days for competing or Miss America contest, the long over, I'm over the age limit. Uh, but I can tell you this, when I walk into the gym, I lead by example. And men ask me for tips. And, you know, I do have a couple of big burly guys at the gym because I live in a mountain community who actually started juicing because of conversations with me. Wow. That's so you, great. That's like a miracle. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I mean, you know, to, you know, to that point, I, I, I actually just, I, I just published an interview with, with one of the writers for the book who I just mentioned, Mac uh, Danzig. You know, one of the questions I asked him, I said, how you know can people like us who follow plant-based diets, we're passionate about it, we've seen the results, um, how can we get the benefit across, the point across and stuff without, you know, coming across as being either, you know, preachy or elitist? And I think that's one of the, the bad, you know, unfortunate stigmas associated with the term vegan. You know, that there are a lot of negative kind of feelings around the term mm -hmm. because people who don't, understand, you know, where you're at or maybe why you're doing it and you, you might be excited about it. You know, sometimes things come across the wrong way. I mean, there is a bit of negativity associated with that word, which is purposely why I try to avoid it. You know, I, I try to focus more on plant-based in the book and, and that being the focus. But, you know, how, how do we get that message across without sounding like we're, we're, we're preaching or, or it becomes, you know, a, a religious or political discussion and then people start taking sides and they defend it, stuff like that. He said the best thing to do is just lead by example and let your energy kind of radiate to people. You know, people will see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll see you in great shape. They'll see, you know, you're looking better. Your eyes are clearer. You know, you're, you're more fit. You're doing better in the gym. And then they'll come to you and they'll ask you. They'll want to know what it is, you know. Right. And, and that's what he said he tries to do. He just tries to, to be a good example of, of what it is that he's trying to accomplish. And, and, you know, his energy kind of reaches out to those around him. And, you know, to, to your point, you know, that's obviously, obviously why these people are coming to you in the gym. They see the progress you've made. They want to know what you're doing. You know, there's a sincere interest there. Absolutely. And that carries so much more weight than you just kind of shaking your finger at them and saying, hey, this is what you need to do. Well, you know, I believe in leading by example on all levels of life, you know, and, you know, people take notice. And at first, they may resent you. Uh, you know, listen, when I first walked into this gym, up, you know, I, I recently moved. When I first walked into the gym, no one talked to me for three months. I mean, three months. And, and you know, gyms are usually very social places. And uh, one day I just went over to this uh, older guy and I said, you know, what is it? I said, you know, nobody talks to me here except you, you know. And he looked at me and he says, because you're intimidating. And I said, what do you mean I'm intimidating? I mean, Scott, you got to understand, I'm in my 60s, okay? Okay. I'm five four and you know 125 pounds, and I don't think of myself as being intimidating. And I said, "What do you mean intimidating?" He says, first of all, everybody knows you know what you're doing." He says, "You look your intelligence level, we can spot it from across the room. 
He says, and let's not leave out your sexy as all get out. And which I thought was a pretty good compliment, but I did get embarrassed because, you know, you get to a certain age where you don't even think about that. Uh, but gradually what ended up happening is other people eventually did take notice and did start asking. I had girls in their 20s come up to me and ask me for tips, ask me how long I've been training. I've had men ask me, you know, what do you eat? Where do you get your protein? I never push that on people, but if they're interested, I will talk, and I have a loud voice, which, of course, attracts other people. Uh, you know, you can't miss my voice no matter where I am. Uh, but never to make anybody feel bad, and I'm always happy to give people information if they want it. If somebody wants to argue, I just walk away. You know, my right. answer to an argument is, you could be right. That always ends the argument, because people just want to be right. I never say you are right. I just say you could be right. So you might want to borrow that one. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's tough, you know, because you don't, you, you want to share, you know, you want to share the excitement, you want to share the results, you want to share the benefits that you've experienced. But you know how, you know, nutrition is such a hotly debated topic. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got the different angles, you know, or are you, uh, are you discussing it, you know, due to, for particularly around the vegan diet, you know, a lot of, I'd say probably the bulk of the people that I know who are vegan or follow plant-based diet or lifestyle, it's mainly ethical. You know, it's not, you know, you get so caught up in the, the animal rights side of it, which I'm, I'm a huge proponent of. I'm, I'm a massive animal rights person. But we, we tend to get so focused on that a lot of times, you know, you forget the health benefits. Right, that's exactly. What, the health benefits for me were, was a pleasant uh, aside. Do you know what I mean? Sure. It was like a plus, Absolutely. but, you know, I couldn't justify being part of, you know, the animal agriculture in this, in this country anymore. I mean, I try to stretch it out as long as possible like everybody else. And then I just, I just couldn't do it. You know, that, that one day, you know, that one book, and then my mind was done. I said, okay, time to give up the excuses, Maria. But, you know, I got a news article yesterday on the show with it where, you know, the newest report says that 30 to 40% of all health care in this country is going to sugar-related diseases. I could, I could believe that. I could believe it. You know, you look at the obesity. You know, when I was a yep. kid, the one fat kid, that was a rarity, okay? Today, the Absolutely. slim kid is the rarity. Absolutely. You know, so people have to look at, you know, all this dis-ease that they have in their bodies. You know, garbage in, garbage out. People hear that, but they don't really think of it in terms of, you know, what they're eating. Well, and activity has a lot to do with it as well, you know, because even when I was a kid, you know, you, you, we had a few heavier set kids in the class, but that, that was not, you know, that wasn't the norm, but we were so active, you know. I, I lived in a very, uh, very rural part of Ohio. We spent all day on our bikes, on our skateboards, and, yeah, we might have eaten candy bars and drank sodas and stuff like that, but, you know, we were out there burning calories, all day, you know, mom, mom didn't want to see you home until it was time for dinner, you know, it's Saturday right. morning, 8 o'clock, you're out the door, mm -hmm. and you're back at 5 o'clock, and we're just running around all day, and that's definitely not the norm for kids nowadays, so coupled with the poor nutrition, you know, they've got, unless they're engaged in school sports and stuff like that, they've really got no physical outlet anymore. Right, and they don't even have an interest, you know, some of the sad stories that I have to read on the news is a lot of children now spend no time in nature, have a total disconnect to nature, yep. and a fear of nature. Yep, absolutely. And that's, we that's, forget, that's you know, the human animal, we are part of nature. We have to be in nature to have mental balance. Yeah, you, you know, that was, uh, that was a good part about growing up in, in a very rural part of Ohio. You know, I, I hate going back there because it's just it's so depressing, but growing up, you know, you lived on a dirt road, you had a huge, huge, huge woods five feet into your backyard, you know, we were out running in the woods all the time, playing down at the creek, climbing trees, you know, we were surrounded by it all the time, and uh, you just you just kind of fell a part of it, and you weren't afraid, you know, to go out in it and, and stuff like that, and, and it was definitely uh, my, one of my favorite places to be growing up was out in the woods, around the trees, and, you know, around the, the creeks and the rivers and stuff like that, it was just, it just felt good. Mm -hmm. Well, you were very fortunate. I mean, I grew up in New York. I grew up in New York City, you know, where, you know, everything was concrete and tar, and that's what we played in, you know. And when I was a little kid, I used to look at Westerns and say, where is all that room? Where is all that? And you know what? It yeah. took me 40 years to get out to the desert, you know, 40 years to see open space. 
Uh, and I appreciate it every single day of my life. I mean, I'm blessed now to be living, you know, in the mountains of Arizona where, you know, I wake up and go out and smell the pine trees. And That's for awesome. me, this is a thrill that will never go away. And nothing, you know, it's something I'll never not appreciate every day of my life because I never had awesome. it. We, we had to walk eight miles just to see a tree. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's we still different. played outside all day and night like wild banshees. <laughs> yeah. Until my father whistled for us. That was the call of the wild when dad whistled out the window and you knew it was time to come <laughs> home. Um, people listening, you know, and again, the book, let me, let me give you the name of the book again, Plant-Based Performance, A Compassionate Approach to Health and Fitness. I have a link here where you can just go in and buy it. The book really does help give people a lot of where to start. And I think that's the problem. People look at this and think it's overwhelming and they don't know sure. where to start. What do you think you you know, the easiest way for people to start? Not just healthy eating, Scott, but also, you know, on the exercise routine. Yeah, I mean, does everybody I, have to go to the gym and, you know, do the Arnold thing? No, no. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it can be overwhelming, you know, and I think a lot of people take this, you know, you see it around the, you know, especially this time of the year, you know, everybody's making the resolutions, getting back in shape and stuff. Like that. People try to bite off too much, you know, right away. They, they, they try to bite off more than they can chew and they can't, you know, it's overwhelming. It's too much of a lifestyle change right. and they end up not sticking to it. They revert back to their comfortable patterns, even though they know they should be there, but it's just something that they know because they've done it for so long. Too much change, it's too extreme, and I think people think, oh my God, you know, I've got to go vegan, i got to get rid of all this stuff, there's nothing left to eat. And, right. and I think taking the approach, you know, not what can't you eat, look at it like, what can I eat? Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my yoga teacher friend, you know, she, she had posted something online one time about, don't think that you can give up a steak and replace it with a bowl of spinach. Right. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, calorically, it's not going to be there. It's not going to have the same texture. It's not going to have the same, you know, so if you're trying to transition into a plant-based diet, you can't take a chunk of meat and replace it with a pile of greens. You know, you need to replace it with things like ground or wild rice and beans and, you know, maybe some tempeh or, or something that's got a little more texture, a little more substance, something that's a little more calorically dense. Because if you gave up all those calorie-heavy foods and you're used to shoveling down, thousands of calories a day and, and you switch to, you know, a, a, a pile of lettuce and a, and a few carrots or something right. like that. You, you know, you have a thousand calories a day right there. Your body's going to be going nuts, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to, you have to ease into it. I, I think uh, it's easier to maybe start with, you know, maybe switching breakfast to a plant-based meal and then eventually switching lunch and eventually switching dinner, you know, maybe breakfast and spend, you know, adding in gradually, go out to the, go out to the grocery store sometime when you're not hungry and explore, you know, walk through the produce mm -hmm. section, go to a farmer's market, you know, and just see all the different, you know, exotic fruits that are in season and fresh and stuff like that. Try some things that you've never tried before. It'll wake you up to a whole world of new tastes, new textures, and getting that variety in your diet is what really, you know, especially the fresh fruit, fresh raw fruits, fresh raw vegetables. That's really, I think, when I started incorporating stuff like that is when I started feeling the difference. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, I got a Vitamix. And I do a lot of smoothies and stuff like that. And I think that's a great way to get a ton of nutrition very quickly, very easily. And once I started incorporating the fresh raw fruits and vegetables and you start feeling the difference, it makes it easier to stick to it and get a little deeper and a little deeper until you're eventually 100%, you know, plant-based and looking back going, man, it really wasn't that hard at all. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's really not. <clears throat> it, it's going, everybody's just going out to eat, blah, blah, blah. I live in Atlanta. You know, it's not a hip you know, coastal city where we have vegan joints. There are some cool vegan restaurants. There are some restaurants that cater to, you know, even some raw vegan dishes and stuff like that. Those are few and far between. You know, going out still is not that hard. If you just do a little prep, you get online, right. you, you know, Google vegan restaurants, vegan menus, there's tons of information out there. You can find a way to navigate in even the worst, you know, cities in the country as far as if you've got to go out and eat and stuff like that. And then as far as the exercise, yeah, you don't got to go to the gym and be Arnold. You, know, you don't have to go to the gym and, and lift weights for an hour or two a day. Some people just need to get outside and start walking, breathing fresh air, you know, doing some body weight exercise, just finding a way to make a daily habit instead of saying, okay, I've got to be on a certain body part split or I've got to do, you know, 10 sets of 10 or, you know, whatever. They, they, start with the basics. Just start making activity a daily, you know, a, a daily, uh, a daily, uh, part of your uh, routine 
and, and find something you like. You know, not everybody needs to go out and bodybuild or power lift or, or lift kettlebells. Or, you know, some people want to go out and do trail runs. Some people want to go on long bike rides. Some people want to study martial arts. Just do something that you're going to enjoy, something that, that gets you active. Right. You know, and that'll spawn a bunch of different things. Even know? dancing. You know, a lot of people like to dance, yeah. but when you ask them when's the last time you danced, they're like, well, you know, where's to go? And I'm like, you, hello, you have a living room, you know? Put some music on and just start dancing. You know, if the right tune comes on while I'm cleaning my house, I'm dancing while I'm cleaning. Okay, it's just it's a normal, natural thing. I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, it was, you know, if I had to learn how to cook three times, you know, because as my diet changed, it's like I had to eliminate the carbs and then learn, well, what do I cook with now? Because, you know, everything was great, throwing some vegetables on some pasta or some rice. Uh, but, you know, it was, a, it was a, a learning experience, okay? I mean, I went from, you know, meat eating to, veg, you know, vegetarian towards more vegan. And, you know, you got to learn how to cook. And I'm like, that's what cookbooks are for. You know, it was no fun yeah, for me to have to retrain my cooking habits, but I learned it. But yeah, in the beginning... So information out there. Right. But you know what? In the beginning, what was a blessing for me, because I like the chewing that you do when you're eating meat. And you kind of miss that texture. You know, you miss the hot dogs. You miss the hamburgers. Okay. So for me, I was very lucky because... It was right about the time that Boca Burgers became more um, more popular. You had Morningstar coming out with fake chicken products, you know, fake fake hamburgers, fake frankfurters, fake cold cuts. You know, and when I say fake, I'm talking about based on, you know, vegan uh, vegetable formulas. Right. For me, that helped me so much in the transition. You know, sure. and I just realized and, and served it to my friends. You know, say I served my friends a hamburger. They didn't know it wasn't meat because really the only thing you truly taste in a burger is everything else you put on it. Yeah, exactly. All the, all the condiments, sure. Yeah, but for me, that really carried me for a goodly while. And I didn't think that I would tire of those things. But as I got healthier and healthier and did more exploring, as you say, I very rarely use those products anymore. But yeah, they were yeah, a huge I, I, I help. I a little variety here and there, you know. Right, but you know what? They were a huge help in the beginning. So today, Absolutely. if somebody wants to become a vegetarian, you have so many more options in the fake There's department the than, say, people 20 years ago when you had to make your own vegan burgers at a Bulgar or whatnot, and they all tasted like you were eating cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty rough. Scott, we're going to take a short break. When we get back, let's talk some more about fitness and the kind of fitness people can do for themselves, the reasons why they should do it. And then let's toss in something even crazier that they might think is not part of it, but mental fitness. And we're talking about meditation. So stay with us, Scott, and I'll be right back. Wow. One solid hour of commercial-free information thanks to you. The person who wants truth has the integrity and understanding to support it with your donation and subscription. Greer believes people can handle the truth and delivers it tirelessly with those with ears to listen. 14 years on the net. Won't you take a moment right now to commit to a subscription of your choice at www.maria.net. That's M-E-R-I-A dot net. Over 1,100 hours of pure education all in one place, 24-7 and all downloadable. Knowledge is power. Sharing that knowledge is wisdom. Together we can change the world and create real hope. Now let's get back to the Maria Heller Show. Okay, welcome back. I hope you're sitting back getting excited over what we're talking about today because believe it or not, this is something people of all ages can do. And, you know, it's no one has to age the way society tells you you have to age. My guest is Scott Shetler, author of several books. Today's book is Plant-Based Performance, A Compassionate Approach to Health and Fitness. Check his work out at scottshetler.com, extreme-fitness.org plantbasedperformance.org. There are links right here. Scott, is there an age limit to being fit? Not at all. Not at all. You know, I know it's, I know it's uh, kind of trendy to say, but age really is just a number. And you really are as, 
young as you feel, you know, and, and it's funny you mentioned that because I had this big thing about aging. You know, when I turned 25, I turned a quarter of a century and I went into this depression that lasted about five years until I hit the, the, the horrible, horrible big 3 0. Oh, and my then gosh. after that, after I started getting, you know, after I started taking my health a little more seriously and stuff like that, and I transitioned to this new, uh, you know, following more of a raw vegan diet and getting more live foods and, and branching out and starting to study the internal martial arts and, you know, Qigong and meditation and stuff like that, you, you realize that what you do to your body. You know, what you put into it, not just the foods. I mean, the foods are important, but also what you read, what you watch on. You know, I, I try not to watch the news and things like that. I mean, you know, there are so many things that are toxic, not just what we ingest in the body through food, but different topics that you come across, things that you watch. And so, so everything that your body absorbs can either be positive or negative. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with aging, you know, gracefully aging healthy and, and just experiencing higher qualities of, you know, just overall abundant health as we approach the later stages of life. And I, I think that's something that it, it, it doesn't matter what age you are, you know, start right now. You know, mm. really now is all there is, you know, it, it, Absolutely. It, there's no better time to start. Absolutely. Wow. I'm sorry you went through that at 25. Oh, my God. People are still asking me now, you know, what was it like when you went through your, you know, change of life or, you know, menopause or whatever, you know. Uh, and I say, why? And I'm like, I haven't had time for that yet. I don't know when that year is going to happen, but I've never gone through that. You know, I just don't have time for it. I stay busy. I'm not worried about how old I'm getting. I just look at how many people younger than me are no longer on the planet or in a whole lot worse physical shape than me. And, you know, I'm happy to be me. You know what I mean? I just don't, I don't have time to worry about getting old. You know, we, I remember when I had a conversation with my father who always kept himself fit and ate healthy. And he was in his 70s and he, was, he said to me, when I get old, and I said, but dad, you know, you're 72, when are you going to figure you're old? And he said to me, when I can't work in my garden anymore. That would be, you know, that, and trust me, that was really it for him. You know, when he couldn't work in his garden anymore, he knew it was time to get ready to leave. Wow. So, you know, it really is the mental state, or as you said, you know, you're only as young as you feel, or as, I don't think if you remember an old-time actress from the 30s, her name was Mae West, and yeah. uh, the, she had a better one. She says, you're only as old as the men you feel. <laughs> <laughs> part of my little wickedness there but I do love her and I love so much about her I can't even tell you okay so fitness can be at any age now I have some friends that are overweight and they ask me how should I start and I tell them basically just start out walking because walking when you're overweight is a weight bearing exercise absolutely you know just carrying your own weight is is exercise you know and a classic you know my my older sister uh, recently lost 150 pounds. That's great. Okay, took her two years, but she's the thinnest and healthiest she's been in her life. So now I'm trying to carefully coax her into going into the gym. But, you know, I guess something triggered in her head, you know, at that particular point. You know, I, she was very overweight. And I had said to her, you know, you're going to be dead in about a year if you don't do something about this. She couldn't breathe like you. You know, she couldn't go up a flight of stairs and breathe. And I think that really caught her attention. I mean, of course, I wouldn't say something so cruel to a stranger, but, you know, sisters can pretty much be as callous as they want to be with each other. So I'm very yeah. proud, you know, of what she did. But, I mean, even the exercise she did, which was basically walking and stretching, was a weight-bearing exercise. Absolutely. But I think yeah, about yeah. it, and I'm like, wow, she got rid of another whole body. That's like a whole yeah. body. That is, that's, that's a tremendous amount of uh, weight to lose. That's awesome that she did it. Mm -hmm. Well, she did it right, though, and, and she, you know, it took two years. She was not looking for these miracle pills and diets that's out there, and people well, have to realize yeah. that stuff will kill you. You know, it, it, it's great that you mentioned that because, you know, that, that, I, I made the comment, and I don't know if I, 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 I'm pretty sure I talked about it in, in my, uh, my last book, Abundant Health, or, you know, I know it's been the topic of a lot of blog articles I've done, but when you look at the state of the fitness industry, and I, I'm really fortunate in that 
early on, I got exposed to many books by some of the, the turn of the century physical culture, you know, like uh, uh, Arthur Saxon and Eugene Sandow and, and uh, George Hackenschmidt. Back then, in the late 1800s, you know, early 1900s, there was this concept of physical culture. And it wasn't you were a weightlifter, a powerlifter, a bodybuilder. It was everything. They, they focused on eating healthy. They focused on being strong. They focused on, you know, being intelligent, reading, you know, furthering their education. It, it, was, it was really this whole concept, this total development concept. And I think over the years, it became fractured. And now we live in a world of extremes in the fitness industry where you have the guys who are mm-hmm. extremely strong or you've got the guys who are extremely big and ripped or you've got the people who are extremely fit. There's no, there's no overlap with anything. It's all about either being the strongest or being the biggest and the leanest or, or being, you know, the most insane, these, these crazy endurance, you know, events. You know, there, there's not a lot of, of balance there. And the further you get into a niche, you know, the further away you get from overall health. And I'm not knocking athletes. I mean, if you want to be competitive, mm-hmm. you know, you, right. you make a sacrifice when you do that. And, and that's the deal that you sign with the devil. You know, if you want to be the best, if you want to be a record holder, you're going to have to do some things that don't jive with being healthy. But that's, that's about being an athlete. Mm-hmm. That's, not about being, that's not about being healthy. And, and I think if we step back and we look at the fitness industry as a whole, there's really nothing about health. You pick up any of the muscle rags on the fitness stand, right. and 30% of it are su- stupid supplement ads that the supplements are probably, one, not beneficial. And, and if they are beneficial, they're probably not healthy. You know, all these weight loss supplements that, that, that have horrible side effects, you know, in the long term and stuff like that. And I think it's because when people associate the word health, it's all external. You know, right. you get this vision of the guy with the big arms and the six pack and this, that, and the other. So it's, what do I got to do to look like that? Mm-hmm. And I think the more mental people are about that whole notion, I think the more they're lacking internal development. And I really think that when you start cleaning up the inside, when you start getting your mind right, when you start getting your spirit right, when you start putting the right things in your body, the outside takes care of itself. Right. And I know I can say that experientially because you know we talked a little bit about uh, my my kind of junk food vegetarian diet I transitioned into after I started cutting out the meat. But the real turnaround came about four or five months later when I was exposed to this whole concept of raw vegan uh, nutrition. I, I was searching online, you know, I thought I'm, I, I said there's got to be some power lifters out there who who are vegan. There's got to be some bodybuilders out there. Mm-hmm. I came across a gentleman, and I'm so fortunate to have him as one of the authors in the book, because he was probably one of my biggest inspirations for making this change. Uh, there's a gentleman that lives in Las Vegas. His name's Danny Dalton, and he's one of the most humble guys on the planet. He was featured in a documentary called, uh, I think it was called Raw Vegan Muscle, that a gentleman named Marcus Rothkranz put out. It was, it was a documentary DVD that had about three or four of these, these raw vegan bodybuilders. And I thought, wow, these guys are eating nothing but raw fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, uncooked, you know, nothing, no cooked food, nothing, raw vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. And these guys look amazing. Mm. And this little, this little 10 minute kind of snippet from the video that featured Danny was the catalyst that got me to start pursuing this, this raw vegan nutrition. And that's when my health really made the biggest changes. You know, I, I drank my first green smoothie and I felt like my head exploded. I thought, wow, this is what real nutrition is like. Mm-hmm. And the weight started falling off me. I started feeling better. And I wanted to, to eat more raw fruits, more raw vegetables. And that was really the biggest turning point. And what, what I didn't realize what was going on, what was happening to me on the outside. And it hit me one day when a client of mine who had been in, in L.A. for about three months, her and her boyfriend came back. And her, and her boyfriend's this, uh, he's like this, uh, this dance teacher, you know, he was, he was a uh, uh, dance performer for a while, and he's, he taught dance, and he's this really, really sharp Australian guy. He's a really cool guy. He, uh, he had seen me before they left, and I was still kind of kind of soft, powerlifter looking, you know, just, just making this transition. He hadn't seen me in about three or four months, and during that time, I had switched to this raw vegan nutrition, and he flipped out. He said, your eyes are clear, your skin looks amazing, uh, you look like a different person. And I didn't really think that because I saw myself daily so that the, the right, you know, was very, very small. Mm-hmm. But to have that much of a realization, people that hadn't seen me in a long time were absolutely blown away. And that's when I realized 
I had begun focusing on the internal aspects of myself. That's when I started meditating more. That's when I started practicing Tai Chi and Qigong with my Shifu here at the Shaolin Institute. Mm -hmm. That's when I, I, I stopped focusing so much on the external, the strength, and the physique. And then what happened was after I cleaned up the inside, I was leaner. I had better muscle definition. I felt better. And I just, I just had a better overall appearance. And I think that's the big disconnect. You know, people are so focused on getting the abs and getting the muscles. Right. They don't focus on the inside. And even the ones that do get there using those, those other methods, they're still not happy because I still think they're searching for something internal that they haven't scratched the surface yet. Right. Well, you know, that's, you're so right. And for a lot of people, I always, often recommend, you know, yoga or Tai Chi because I know that's what they need. You know, they need that spiritual connection. People don't realize how many uh, martial arts there are that really do help develop you on a spiritual level. Because you can't leave Absolutely. out the spiritual and just work on the physical. You're just an empty shell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I totally agree. You know, uh, I remember, God, it's got to be over a year ago, maybe maybe longer, uh, Joe Cross's movie, uh, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. Yeah. And I remember watching the movie when I had just started working out with my trainer. I was already feeling pretty damn good. And, like, I had a whole program laid out ahead of me, you know, my food, my, my supplements, so everything I needed. And then I watched that movie. And I remember that even the first time I watched it, I sat there and cried. I cried tears of joy for that young man that's in his movie, the uh, truck driver. I don't remember his name. But yeah, the, the yeah. progress that guy made and when he puts out and he's lecturing and he puts, you know, a bowling ball on the counter for every 15 pounds he had lost and he's got like eight bowling balls on the counter saying this is what I was carrying around every day. I became so fascinated with the concept of juicing that, you know, I told my trainer, I says, how about I just juice all day and never eat food? And he's like, Maria, let's take it one step at a time. Uh, so it took a while, but then, you know, I did get a juicer, and, and I did start juicing. And as a result, several of my friends bought juicers and started juicing because they'd come over and I'd say, hey, I'm just whipping up this juice. You want to try it? And, I, and it gave me a good opportunity to talk to them about it. I actually sat, had sat down with my friend who didn't have access online to watch Fat Sick and Nearly Dead. I sat down with her and watched it with her. And at the end of the movie, through which mostly she was speechless, she said, will you go with me to the grocery store now and show me what I need to buy? And I did. That shows when you love your friends and you love other people, you're happy to show them how to do it. And there are pleasant ways to do it without beating people up. I don't want to be a born again when it comes to fitness. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, that, that movie, there was a lot of inspiration, and to see, uh, I, I think the guy's name was Phil, uh, that that Joe met, you know, the, the truck driver. I think his uh -huh. name was Phil, and, and uh, you know, to see the to see him come to terms with, you know, he knew where where he was headed was not, it wasn't where he wanted to be, you know, and he just wanted to be healthy and stuff like that, and and he was at that point where he was ready to do whatever it takes, and I mean, it was just. You know, it, it was great that they literally just bumped into each other and he was able to help him out in the transition that that guy made and just completely turned his life around, which is, it, it was incredibly inspirational. I was, I was like a basket case movie. crying. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it, it was awesome. I mean, if it didn't touch something inside you, you, you you're not human, you know. And, right. uh, you know, I think everybody can see a little bit of themselves in that, you know, because whether it's, whether it's weight, whether it's disease, whether it's, you know, everybody's got some struggle, you know, that, that you're trying to accomplish. So anytime you see somebody, uh, uh, you know, take hold of their life, take control of their life, and turn it around in, in, in all the positive that comes from that, I, I think it's inspirational, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I constantly tell people to watch it. I know he's working on a new film. Uh, so he's a little difficult. I have tried to get him on my show, but it's a little difficult getting, you know, getting his schedule to gel, but one day that will happen. I make a promise to myself, one day he will be on my show. Um, what about water? Okay, a lot, you know, I, I see people, you know, even at the gym, you know, they drink them from the water fountain. I know that fountain is not filtered water. How important is it to drink clean water? And what kind of water do you use? I mean, I, you know, I, I don't have a degree in, in uh, biochemistry or anything like that. I mean, I can't really get into the, the you know, the, 
I, I guess, that, that side of it, you know, because there are a lot of arguments. You know, you should have this type of water. You should have this type of filter. You know, you should get all the, the heavy metals and all that junk out of the, you know, tap water and this and that. And, and you know, you start hearing things about the what goes into, you know, the, the water that comes out of your faucet. It, it's kind of scary, you know, to, to know that there's those types of, of, you know, heavy metals. There's those types of, of toxic substances, you know, like the, and I know the whole, you know, fluoride argument, you know, right. with, with the levels that are in drinking water and, and how it could potentially accumulate in your body over time. And I know there's people that will debate that. So, I mean, I, I'm not really in a position where I can comment on that because I'm, I'm not, you know, a scientist. Well, maybe the, question, I mean, maybe the question should have been how much water? How much water should people yeah. be drinking? I say drink, drink the, you know, one, get the cleanest water you can get your hands on, you know. And, and generally what I do is I'll either buy just gallon jugs of spring water, you know, at the grocery store, or we buy glass, uh, we buy either glass or BPA-free, you know, plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we go to Whole Foods uh, by our house. They've got a water refill station in there where it's only 39 cents a gallon. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can get the reverse osmosis, you know, seven-step filtrated, you know, water or whatever. Right. I'm pretty sure that that's pretty good water. And at 39 cents a gallon, you really can't beat it. In fact, not only do we drink that, but all our pets drink it as well, too. We don't, we don't give our uh, pets water out of the tap anymore either. Um, we do keep a filter on our, our sink, um, you know, mainly for like cleaning, uh, you know, vegetables and produce and stuff like that. But as far as like how much water, a long time ago, I came across a, uh, across an equation in some, I don't know if it was a strength conditioning article I was reading or what, but the person who wrote the article recommended 0.66 times your body weight and that being the number of ounces you need. So just, just out of curiosity, I, I, I did the formula at the time and it turned out being about 115 or 120 ounces, which for me, that, you know, that's right about a gallon. And, and, and pretty much what I would do is I would get a, a gallon jug of, you know, spring water or, you know, that filtered water and I'd drink that daily and I never had an issue. Now, some people will say use the color of your urine, you know, if it's light yellow or clear, then you're probably pretty well mm -hmm. hydrated. You know, if it's, if it's darker yellow, you're probably not getting enough. And, of course, some people like to say, you know, if you're waiting to drink until you're thirsty, then, you know, you're certainly not getting enough water as well. So there's a lot of different ideas floating around out there. But I really don't think, you know, unless you're you're guzzling down gallons and gallons and gallons a day, you're really going to overdo it on the water. I, I think right. some people could, could right. stand to increase the amount of water that they drink. I mean, most people I talk to live off of diet sodas, sodas, coffee, you know, things Yeah, but that, that doesn't count as water intake. That's like the worst crap you can drink. You know, to exactly. me, what I what I learn, and you know, I think it's just the easiest way. You know, is half your body weight in ounces of water. And when I tell that to people, they go into shock because most people don't even drink one glass of water a day. Oh uh, yeah, not one. You know, they'll, they'll like you know, like we said, they'll put it in their they make coffee with water, or they might you know use water as a base for something. But yeah, they're not just drinking clean, fresh water. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I know that that, you know, that's real important. I've interviewed some, some great doctors on my show, and I remember one doctor saying that he believed all headaches were caused by people not drinking enough water. Really? That's interesting. So, you know, I mean, you know, so, and, you know, when you talk to a trainer or a nutritionist, they tell you right out, you know, tea and coffee and soda doesn't count as water intake. You can't add that. It's because a lot of that is really, you know, they'll dehydrate you more than they will hydrate. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, water is definitely the most important. Thing. I mean, isn't it, you know, you can only go so many days, you know, without water, but you can go so many days without food. I mean, water is, is it seems to be the essential the essential uh, uh, component. You know, you can go a lot longer without food than you can water. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I forgot what percentage of our body is, and it's something like 70% or something like that. Yeah, or I guess more of our than body that. is water. Right. So right. There, there's, there's something to that. Absolutely. Well, Scott, I want to tell you that it was, it was so informative and so much fun having you on the show today. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Well, I want to thank you, too. And, I mean, are you still training people in person? Can people work with you in person? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a couple different things. Uh, right now, I've got my, uh, my brick and mortar location, which is just uh, on, the, on the north side of Atlanta in, uh, in North Cross, Georgia. Uh, so people can train with me one on one. I also do, uh, because of my books and things like that, I do have a lot of correspondence around the country and worldwide. I've actually started doing a lot of online coaching and online training for people. Mm -hmm. um, and with Atlanta being such a business hub, a lot of people will travel through Atlanta 
you know, on business or work and stuff like that. And they'll schedule sessions with me whenever they're in town. But I, and, and, uh, you know, on top of the online coaching and training, I've definitely been asked to speak at different, uh, events and things like that. So I, I am looking, uh, especially this year, one of the things I want to do is start doing more, more speaking engagements, you know, getting out there, traveling a little bit more, uh, just, I, I want to reach more people, you know, and I think that's why I really focused on writing the books and, and networking with some of the great, you know, people that contributed to this last book and stuff like that, because I think, you know, we're finding that a lot of people are, are really interested in the same message mm-hmm. and, you can't, you know, I, I can't reach that many people inside the four walls of my training center here in Atlanta. Right, you know, exactly. I, I love my clients and I, I love, I'm very fortunate that I get to do what I do and I, I don't have to go, you know, punch a time clock. I, I, I'm running my own business. It's outstanding. But the, as I get into the later stages of my life, you know, but really I, I feel like the purpose of my life is one, to help people experience what true health is and two is to help end the suffering of of animals and and sentient beings i feel like those are the two things that i've kind of been put here in this lifetime to do and and i really want to make the next phase of my life getting out there and doing as much as i can in those regards and that's kind of where this this book came from i wanted to do something to benefit mercy for animals and try to give back to some amazing people who do some great 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 things on that side, and then the other thing, you know, and that was the focus of my, my last book, Abundant Health, is I want people to realize that true health comes from the integration, and it's not just the physical, but it's the integration of the mind, body, and the spirit, and, and that's what the topic of my Abundant Health book was about. I wrote that, and I kind of want to follow that up with, is, you know, much speaking and presenting and, and different engagements like that over, you know, the next uh, year or so to really start getting my message out there, meeting more people, and hopefully... Uh, helping people make those types of positive changes that I've experienced. Well, that's great. Well, you got a good start today on my show, so thanks again for joining me, Scott. Stay in touch. Well, thank you, Maria. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye. Scott Shetler. So, if you want to be happy, you got to be healthy. And if you're healthy, you're going to be happy. Anyway, thanks for listening and supporting the show. Uh, tell your friends about what you learn here. You know, like my teacher Sunbear used to say, you know, taking in knowledge just for the sake of taking in knowledge is a waste of time. He said, knowledge doesn't become wisdom until you share it with somebody. And again, stay tuned for tomorrow's show, which will be Blood and Guts with myself and my fabulous friend and co-host Jack Blood. Again, thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys then. Thank you for listening and supporting The Maria Show. Tell others what you learned today. Knowledge becomes wisdom only when it's shared. Encourage others to subscribe today. www.maria.net Often imitated, never duplicated. A world of information all in one place. www.maria.net Always ahead of the curve. Always on your side. Get active or get radioactive. Subscribe today.